first of all, that something like Bitcoin was inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, and that now, now that we have it, that it is absolutely unstoppable. Um, and it did not just inspire uh, Satoshi to, to build Bitcoin. Uh, or, well, I mean, this, this piece inspired so many people. Uh, you know, BitTorrent certainly got inspired from it. Ha a proof of work, um, like Adam Back, was certainly inspired by, by, by this and, and following writings. Um, and of course, the things that we're doing now, uh, uh, you know, in the cutting edge with, with Bitcoin um, nowadays and the Bitcoin privacy that is going on, this is all re really going back to, to this piece as, as a root or, or a very deep dependency uh, in, in this network of knowledge that we've built up around well, individual freedom and, and anarchist thought and cryptography uh, as, as a principle. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the collection of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized U.S. dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Max Hillebrand, welcome back to the What Is Money show. Thanks, Robert. Uh, it was a great pleasure speaking with you on the last series, and I'm really looking forward to getting into this next one. Yeah, as am I. Uh, it's great to have you back. I've learned so much in our last series together and going through The Ethics of Liberty by Rothbard. Um, just a really eye-opening book. And just by way of quick introduction for my audience, uh, you are a free software entrepreneur. You are a contributor to Wasabi Wallet and the CEO of ZK Snacks, which is the company behind Wasabi Wallet. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we're going to kick off this, a new series that I think we're going to call the Crypto Anarchist Series. 
And we're starting by going through a work written by Timothy C. May in 1988, titled The Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And so a couple of things are a little bit different. First of all, we're going to read the manifesto in full to begin, and then we'll kind of unpack it line by line. And um, this is, I mean, help me introduce this. As I understand this, this is one of the formative documents for cypherpunks, crypto anarchism, um, and very short, but very, very potent read. Um, is there any background or anything on this piece you'd like to share? Yeah, this is definitely a cornerstone in, in the digital history uh, or computer science history. Uh, it, it was written at a time where there was a lot of cryptography and, and internet networking tools, emails, etc. Uh, already in existence. Um, yet it, this, this really just showed where this future could possibly go to. Uh, and a lot of what is being mentioned is definitely playing out uh, right now in front of our eyes. And uh, Bitcoin is a, a incredible fit into this. So this is at the very root of of Bitcoin as an idea, uh, as as a point in time. So it's it's very pivotal, and I think quite mandatory read for for any Bitcoiner. Mm. Yeah, I remember when I, I first was getting into the Bitcoin rabbit hole, and I found the work of Nick Zabo, and it seems to be along those lines, right? Very prescient kind of work. These guys are again written in 1988 writing about things that we are experiencing now in 20 in the 2020s basically um okay well i'm i'm super excited about this uh again this is like a, a very instrumental piece to the entire philosophy underpinning bitcoin um and, and all the values that it represents so with that i guess we should just start by reading this thing the crypto anarchist manifesto by timothy c may a specter is haunting the modern world, the specter of crypto anarchy. Computer technology is on the verge of providing the ability for individuals and groups to communicate and interact with each other in a totally anonymous manner. Two persons may exchange messages, conduct business, and negotiate electronic contracts without ever knowing the true name or legal identity of the other. Interaction over networks will be untraceable via extensive rerouting of encrypted packets and tamper-proof boxes, which implement cryptographic protocols with nearly perfect assurance against any tampering. Reputations will be of central importance, far more important in dealings than even the credit ratings of today. These developments will alter completely the nature of government regulations, the ability to tax and control economic interactions, the ability to keep information secret, and will even alter the nature of trust and reputation. The technology for this revolution, and it is surely, and it surely will be both a social and economic revolution, has existed in theory for the past decade. The methods are based upon public key encryption, zero knowledge interactive proof systems, and various software protocols for interaction, authentication, and verification. The focus has until now been on academic conferences in Europe and the US, conferences monitored closely by the National Security Agency. But only recently have computer networks and personal computers attained sufficient speed to make the ideas practically realizable. And the next 10 years will bring enough additional speed to make the ideas economically feasible and essentially unstoppable. High network, high speed networks, ISDN, Tamper-proof boxes, smart cards, satellites, ku band transmitters, multiple MIPS personal computers, and encryption chips now under development will be some of the enabling technologies. The state will, of course, try to slow or halt the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns, use of the technology by drug dealers and tax evaders, and fears of societal disintegration. Many of these concerns will be valid. Crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to be traded freely and will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded. An anonymous computerized market will even, possible, will even make possible abhorrent markets for assassinations and extortion. Various criminal and foreign elements will be active users of cryptonet, but this will not halt the spread of crypto anarchy. 
just as the technology of printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds and the social power structure. So too will crypto cryptologic methods fundamentally alter the nature of corporations and of government interference in economic transactions. Combined with emerging information markets, crypto anarchy will create a liquid market for any and all material which can be put into words and pictures. And just as seemingly minor inventions like barbed wire made possible the fencing off of vast ranches and farms, thus altering forever the concepts of land and property rights in the frontier vest, so too will the seemingly minor discovery out of an arcane branch of mathematics come to be the wire clippers which dismantle the barbed wire around intellectual property. Arise, you have nothing to lose but your barbed wire fences. Such a cool kind of haunting piece of writing in a way. Um, yeah, short, to the point, uh, quite creative. And uh, it's it still rings true almost 35 years later. Yeah, again, written in 1988. And, um, you know, the opening line, he's describing this as a specter haunting the modern world. But there seems to be some ambivalence here, right? Where it's not necessarily a negative thing that he's describing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, it's a transformation in the way humans deal with one another commercially and or communicate with one another. Um, and I've got a lot of questions about some of the, the specific things he described, but I guess we'll just kind of work our way through this line by line. So, um, yeah, I think the specter analogy right up front is, is it like really sets the scene, you know, it's a bit spooky, almost like a ghost. Uh, and ultimately crypto anarchy is, is an idea. Right? This this is its code, software, and and uh, principles uh, to think. Right? So uh, this is something of, of cyberspace. This is something that is not tangible in in physical reality. Crypto anarchy literally is a specter uh, that is that is uh, like hunting or haunting our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an idea that you just can't get rid of, uh, and and that is the specter of crypto anarchy. Yeah. So maybe we could start by just parsing apart that term, crypto anarchy. Now, the crypto component, and I, I don't understand this as well, but he's basically saying that the use of cryptographic tools to secure information and anonymize communication, commercial transactions, et cetera. Um, so there's the, I guess that's reflecting the technological component of this uh, revolution, I guess you would call it. And then the the anarchy component is more of the the consequences of that technological shift, right? That, as I understand the word anarchy, and this is a very misunderstood word, people often use it to invoke a sense of chaotic lawlessness or something like that. But what it actually means is uh, an archon. So it's referring to an, as in like the absence of something. When we say like anaerobic exercise, it's it's non aerobic exercise and an archon is a ruler right it's a, a term that refers to a, an actual political ruler of some kind so anarchy or anarchon refers to no rulers right no no um dominant individuals so it doesn't mean no laws or no rules it means no rulers and that's something we often you know it's a refrain we often hear in bitcoin Money, uh, what does it say? Rules without rulers, I think is the common refrain that I hear in Bitcoin. And so that's a very key thing to keep in mind. And um, yeah, again, it's not necessarily positive or negative in a, in a sense, but it's just a very fundamental shift in the way we we deal with one another. Yeah, exactly. And, and the so anarchy is about having a, a sovereign control over your body, and it's very closely tied to the to the self ownership principle. Uh, and it's also closely tied to to owning private property in, in goods and, and materials and, and products. And so all, all of this is, is wrapped into anarchy. And uh, the crypto part is then, well, cryptology, right, this arcane math, a branch of math, uh, which which deals with like, uh, well, just a couple math formulas, but this is ultimately then used 
you know, in order to protect the interests of your body or, or of your property. And like, um, for example, a computer, a physical instantiation, you know, physical hardware, um, silicon, copper, whatever, uh, is actually being used in order to do those cryptographic computations. And so you can only do like do cryptographic computations if you, if you control and, and own the computer, otherwise you cannot, right? So uh, in order to do cryptography, anarchy is, is required, right? To be able to control your body and your, your tools around you to do the computation that, that you see fit. Uh, so these these two are extremely closely linked. Interesting. And what when when we invoke that that arcane branch of mathematics, what are we saying about crypto that's such a fundamental and and to be clear, this is not another one of those terms that's become muddied, right? You now say the word crypto, people think you mean cryptocurrencies or crypto assets today in 2020, but that's not this, that's not the way Timothy was invoking this term. Do you, um, can you explain a little bit about what that means? Like, what is it about cryptographic tools? What are they enabling that was not possible before, I guess, that, that's, that's leading to this revolution? Yeah, and the, the next sentence in the manifesto describes it perfectly, right? So computer technology uh, provides the ability for individuals to communicate and interact with each other in a totally anonymous manner. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of this in this, right? So for one, it's computer technology is, is already hinted at. And so this requires a, a computational device instantiated in, in hardware, uh, can be digital, probably should be. Um, uh, and then this gives you an ability, right? So this is a tool that, that you can use to satisfy uh, your desires. Uh, you you want to achieve something, and this is a tool that provides you the ability to to get this done. And and what you want to achieve is to communicate with others, mm-hmm. right? You you're, you're social creatures. We want to ask others for help and and uh, communicate with them and trade with them, uh, and uh, interact in numerous any other ways. Uh, but we want to have the ability, uh, or crypto anarchy is is about getting the ability to do this to- totally anonymous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anonymous is is really interesting. It basically means without a name. And that you cannot attribute a, a certain action to a certain name, your your uh, true name, your your real identity. Uh, so if if that is uh, if that is enabled, then you live anonymously and you you are true to to that cypherpunk uh, or a- crypto anarchist ability uh, to to communicate secretly, uh, and that's what uh, cryptography enables us to do. And mm-hmm. we can encrypt a certain message to a certain public key. So that only he who knows the private key can decrypt and therefore read the message that we are sending. So we're giving specific intent uh, of of whom you're communicating to, and someone who is who does not know that private key is uh, excluded from learning about that communication. He cannot read the text, um, not because you don't allow him to, but because it's mathematically impossible for him because of the the beautiful uh, you know trapdoor functions of of cryptography. Hmm. So then if crypto then entails that we can use things, these communication tools and protocols anonymously. So you're effectively able to, I guess, unbundle. Uh, people can unbundle their, say, state-issued ID from their online ID, right? Or, or their actual name from their online presence, things like this. And this... Uh, would in my mind expand the options available to individuals, right? Like now you could go and enter into a a certain business dealing that you may not want to do under your own name. You can now do that through these these tools. A- again, he's he's writing about this sort of forward looking, um, but now today, like many of these things are actually possible, right? We, we see a lot of this this unbundling of of identification, and the implications that are really hard to think through because. I mean, right now, almost everything is tied to your your state issued ID, but the fact that you could go and establish an online presence that's dissociated from your state ID and actually earn revenue or or income through that, um, obviously that has very significant implications for for taxation and, and tracing economic flows and whatnot. And I think that's that seems to be what he's alluding to that's going to be so disruptive to to government right that's how 
and this is this is get back to the, gets back to the sovereign individual. The governments are very accustomed to being able to track and trace economic flows. Yet in the digital realm, that becomes much more difficult. And so the question becomes: if governments can't generate revenue in that way, what happens next? Right? Like, what are the implications of governments having? I guess people having more autonomy, which is the uh, the flip side of that is governments generating less revenue through traditional modes of taxation. And then that's kind of the the opening to Pandora's box right there. It's like, well, okay, what happens next then? Because that's a, that's a very fundamental change in the way humans have have organized themselves since since time immemorial, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and Timothy May here doesn't even make a value judgment whether or not this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. He's just making a matter of fact observation. Mm -hmm. um, people are able. Uh, to to you know communicate with without knowing the true names or legal identities of the other party mm -hmm. that that is a fact um uh, and uh, encryption just made this even more apparent but you know it's it's even true like without encryption in in, in real life you know when, when you talk to your wife you don't have to show her your government state id you know every time be before mm -hmm. before she lets you into the house you know that uh, it, there's a a certain identity, a, a relationship between two people uh, is established, and and uh, you know reputation and and history uh, that that depends on each unique uh, communication, basically, or each unique interaction between the people, and it changes across time too. Right, your identity to to your wife was very different when she was still your girlfriend, or when you didn't know her at all. Right. Um, uh, so this uh, it, this is just something that now by using uh, you know private public key cryptography, uh, untraceable networks, or, you know, rerouting packages, etc. all of the technical things that are mentioned uh, in, in this manifesto, um, then this just all of a sudden becomes, you know, mathematically bulletproof, uh, so mm -hmm. to say, it's an instantiation of, of how things, you know, actually are um, uh, just in, in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so almost like uh, these tools enable enable us to scale the privacy that we enjoy in one-on-one -on -one, person to person communications, but at a much over much longer distances, right. And across broader spans of time. So yeah, it, it enables an entire other mode of communication, right. To talk to people across space and time is, is ridiculous. That that was never a thing. Right. And, but if you technically look at it, the only reason because it works is because of of these crypto anarchist tools that were just mentioned. Mm -hmm. you know, there is simply no internet without encryption. Uh, right. it, it like technically doesn't work, right? So all of these things that we've now achieved are, you know, at the very core of, uh, or the, the result of those core principles uh, outlined here. Yes. Yeah, I guess the, the only somewhat of a caveat to that would be that the current iteration of the internet has a lot of these walled gardens, right? Where sure people can't read i send an email from from me to someone else that excludes everyone else in the world from reading it but it's still censorable or monitorable by google or whoever the, the email service provider is whereas i think the the world he's painting here as he says here in the third line right two persons may exchange messages conduct business and negotiate electronic contracts without ever knowing the true nature or i'm sorry true name or legal identity of the other so interactions over networks will be untraceable via extensive rerouting of encrypted packets and tamper-proof boxes, which implement cryptographic protocols with nearly perfect assurance against any tampering. So, you know, we've had some capacity to communicate across time and space prior to the internet, prior to cryptographic tools, things like the telegraph, telephone, etc., but the privacy element was never really there, right? And this reintroduces, you know, when I think privacy element, like two people sitting in a room alone talking, right? With the presumption that the room is not bugged, that there's a fairly high assurance of privacy. But as soon as you remove, separate those people across space and right, they're trying to talk over a telephone line or whatever, well, that introduces more attack surface, I guess you might say, and, and uh, lowers the assurance of privacy. But what he's saying here is that these cryptographic tools can then give you this very high assurance of privacy while still communicating at a distance across space or time. Exactly, right? And in your analogy, when, when using Gmail, 
Right. The cool thing is, if you would encrypt a message to a PGP key or something and upload that to Gmail, mm -hmm. then Google literally could not read the, that message. It, it's just not possible for them because they don't know the private key. And so a, a lot of things get get possible or, or are being enabled by these tools, even then relationships with, with semi-trusted third parties. Can you unpack that a little bit mechanically, the, the way you just described how if you use a PGP key, you can even obfuscate the communication from Google. Like, how does that, I don't want to get super down to the technical weeds, but just for the audience, like a general idea of how that works compared to just sending the email traditionally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you, first you need to generate a private key, uh, uh, just as with a Bitcoin wallet. Um, so you do that by flipping a coin basically, or software does it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have a secret. Uh, and knowing the secret, you can uh, derive another large number, uh, which is your public key. And so you have a private key and a public key. Uh, and you can give now someone else uh, public uh, your public key, like Robert and me, we could exchange our public keys. Um, and now when I want to send Robert an email, uh, I write my message, hey, Robert, what's up? Um, uh, uh, and I, I now take this message uh, and put it together with Robert's public key, which I know, and it's not a secret, it's it's public, he gave it to me. Uh, and I put it into a mathematical formula. And, and the end result of that uh, is a, a a really long looking gibberish number. Uh, it's not really any anything readable, uh, just a bunch, bunch of ones and zeros, basically. But now I can take these ones and zeros and write them in Gmail uh, and send the email to Rob. And when Google looks at it, they just see ones and zeros, uh, but no intelligible message. They don't know how long the message is or, or what's the content. Um, uh, but then Robert can take the cipher text message, this, this garbled text, and uh, to put it into a math formula together with his private key. Uh, so mm -hmm. private key plus encrypted message uh, results. Uh, the result of this formula is then a decrypted message. Mm -hmm. uh, so magically, Robert can, can uh, turn this gibberish into the actual text uh, that that I that, mm. that I intended, and so I've I've just conveyed intent or, or like meaning in a message, um, but the, the actual text that I send wasn't meaningful per se. You needed to have that that cipher text plus a private key in order to get the actual meaningful information out, uh, and and that is private public key encryption. Got it. Okay, so it's like very much like um, wartime encryption, right? Where different countries would be sending messages that they only um main or had the key to and then the countries they're warring against are constantly trying to figure out what the key is that what what is that movie the imitation game mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i think was a really really great example of that so so that that's interesting it makes sense yeah what how does this then okay so we're talking about scaling super private communication which then allows people to adopt different identities for different purposes, essentially online. Um, how, how does this lead into, I'm trying to understand the segue into the next line where he says, reputations will be of central importance, far more important in dealings than even the credit ratings of today. What is it about reputations just become much more important in that world because you don't have some type of central authority signing off on people's credibility or, or reputation is is that what he's saying there or how how, how do we do we understand this yeah exactly um i mean reputation has always been of central importance mm -hmm. right including with for example uh, credit uh, ratings etc this this is a core part of reputation um but what he means is that when you know when when a new person walks into your town and you've never seen him before well are you going to trust him you know are, are you going to let him into your house or are you going to you know do, do business with him or whatever uh but that uh, uh like why why would you trust him basically you don't you don't know him right and the the re or the way that this new person would build up his his trustability is by building up his reputation and right? by sticking around by maybe offering help uh or or you know being active in the community whatever but through repetitive interactions uh, humans can can will we'll see the mode of of engagement that this person has not just once uh, but for recurring games, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that is why reputation is important in 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 a village, right? In in meat space. 
Uh, but it's it's of course also the same in in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. uh, even and by the way, even with your you know national or true name real identity, uh, where you you still have to build up reputation. And right? even if if someone knows that that my name is Max, that that still doesn't mean that all of a sudden I I'm highly trusted or, or reputable. Right? Um, however, especially with identities that you can quickly change and with identities where there's no obs observable linkage between the two. And so, uh, you know, I create one private key pair and another private key pair. They, they're fundamentally different right? and then they're indistinguishable. Like they, they, nothing tells that these two belong to me um, by default as, as I generate them. And so this, this means that I can spin up a new identity very easily, but this means I will have to build up a reputation for this identity again uh, in, in order to do what, what I want to do, you know, in, in the Bitcoin context. First, you generate a private key and, and an address, the public key, but that's nothing, right? You, uh, th that's not Bitcoin yet. You need to have a reputation on your identity, which means on the Bitcoin blockchain, your address, your public key must be mentioned with a certain amount of Bitcoin. That's a reputation in, in, in the Bitcoin sense, uh, and it is of central importance um, because this way we can kind of track the behavior of, of certain identities uh, w without... Uh, uh, well, yeah, and and giving them a, a sense of quality uh, and and using this data to make decisions in how we in, interact or engage with with these identities. Hmm. Yeah, it's so would it be fair to say that the credit score is somewhat like a centrally certified, a central certification of someone's character, right? Or that what to expect from dealing with a certain person, right? Mm -hmm. uh, issued from a central authority, right? Like a credit score bureau, I suppose. Exactly. Whereas rep reputation is something more traditional, right? As you're describing in the village, that it's it's like like a decentralized certification of one's character. Where you know Rothbard actually Rothbard made the great point, I think in Ethics of Liberty that reputation is not owned, right? You don't own your reputation; it's not an asset. It's something that people are just creating for you, right? It's based mm -hmm. on your actions. You participate in its creation, but you don't own it in the same way that you own uh, a scarce, you know, excludable good. Um, it's a co-created phenomena of some kind. And it's, you know, traditionally that's what people really relied upon was just this kind of decentrally determined assessment of your character called the reputation. But in the fiat model, um, we've moved towards these kind of centrally determined assessments of character rather than, than decentrally determined reputation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, credit rating is, is kind of a specific case of, of a reputation. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it also involves cash flow analysis, et, et cetera. You know, it has a purpose of will you be able to pay back your, your credit in the future? Right. Um, and, th you know, that's the specific reputational question that the credit ratings try try to address. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in the next line, he says, then these developments will alter completely the nature of government regulation, the ability to tax and control economic interactions, the ability to keep information secret, and will even alter the nature of trust and reputation. One example of this, I like, even with something as simple as ride sharing apps like Uber and Lyft how quickly that digital alternative to traditional taxi service, how quickly that altered the nature of trust between individuals, right? Like if you rewound the clock 10 or 15 years prior to Lyft and Uber, the idea of summoning a stranger to come and pick you up and drive you from point A to point B and just jumping in the car with a stranger, like that would be, I think, uh, advised against by most people. Like, you know, you don't, you don't <laughs> want to do that. But as soon as we had this kind of reputation management market system, all of a sudden it's no big deal, right? It, it just, it, it destroyed the taxi cab business in most parts of the world. And now no one thinks twice about summoning a, a stranger's car to jump in the back seat with them and, and uh, use it as transport. Um, what other areas do you think he's referring to here? I mean, because altering the nature of trust and reputation, um, 
what what do you think he's he's focusing on specifically here? It just seems kind of very general. And I don't I don't know where he's he's pointing mm -hmm. that. Well, in the in the term in the terms of of trust, right? There's many aspects of trust, but but one thing like I don't know. Do you trust that I said a certain thing in the past, for example? You know that that type of relationship. And again, we can use cryptography to prove this, right? You can make a digital signature, um, that, that, like basically saying that that uh, that message was was seen and acknowledged by the person who knows that private key. You know, and and that might be you know a, a way to improve trust. You know, this this is by the way how uh, Bitcoin proof of reserves work, right? You can sign a message with the private key that locks up a hundred Bitcoin, and now you've just built trust uh, with someone saying, "Hey, look, I can control these hundred Bitcoin here uh, on the blockchain." That that would be one way that we're truly changing the nature of of trust itself, or, or we're at least moving it into a, a whole different concept, and and likewise with reputations. You know, like, for example, I, I, uh, I'm i an Uber driver and I have my public key, let's say, and every time I have a successful Uber ride, uh, you know, someone signs my public key or something, right? So we have a rating system that that I cannot fake. You know, I cannot brew, I cannot fake a signature from one of the riders and just claim that, that I did a good job because I don't know that guy's uh, private key. And so uh, uh, that that basically means that an, a, th a third party observer can can could go through this reputation system and actually verify that hey look a hundred different people actually said that this is this was a good writer, uh, so that that is a a verifiable way to, way to do a reputation system right and these are just a couple examples but the 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 way to build or engineer trust and reputation systems with digital technologies like encryption is is near. Uh, endless. I mean, Bitcoin is is one pinnacle of of such creativity. Mm. Yeah, that's great points there. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering here to alter completely the nature of government regulation, the ability to tax and control economic interactions. Um, so if we are removing, I guess, or, or uh, minimizing the attack surface for governments to tax and control you know, assets, economic flows, et cetera. It seems to me like that is equivalent to saying that we're reducing the limitations they can place on private property in a way, right? Like, because, well, obviously taxation, control, anything that you, any avenue in which you stop or inhibit someone from enjoying their asset, right? Whether you're, you're skimming some off, skimming some of the value off via taxation, or you're saying you can't use that asset for this purpose, these are all limitations on the individual's right to enjoy their assets. Do you think that these crypto tools then would actually amplify the free market process in terms of allowing us to generate more wealth, maybe perhaps decreasing the relevance of government over time? He also says here that the ability to keep information secret um, what what is the theme here? Uh, like, you know, I'm thinking through the lens of of Bitcoin kind of reducing the relevant of government relevance of government over time, just by virtue of removing um, one of the revenue sources. But what do you see? What is the impact you see these other tools or these other aspects of these tools having on government itself? I mean, it's 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 super different, right? Like everything. I mean, 1998, right? There, that was before basically the internet. You know, before calls or, or video calls live, uh, you know, over the internet. Like, which just alone that changes everything. Right. You know, that that people inside a certain government jurisdiction can talk to each other whenever they want uh, and talk privately, knowing that nobody can spy on this information because it is well encrypted, etc. But then they can also talk with people outside of that jurisdiction, you know, to to see get a feeling of how it is on on, on the other side if the grass is really greener, mm -hmm. right? So we we get much more knowledgeable uh, about what's what's actually going on and and what the you know what's what's happening on on the world, uh, and you know that then further enables uh, remote uh, work that that you you know go to the Bahamas and mm -hmm. uh, work from there and you know communicate with all your employees and and suppliers etc. Um, from cyberspace that uh, that is you know j just that it's a tiny subsection but it's a in insane a absolutely insane amount of change to how life was 50 years ago mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's a great point uh, um 
I mean, I know he's he's not putting a value judgment on this, but I, in my view, it's just like you're talking about basically these tools empower individuals, right? And if you give, I think there's a great quote by Matt Ridley that uh, prosperity is the the child of freedom. I'm sorry, innovation is the child of freedom and the parent of prosperity. So when you talk about getting, mm-hmm. you're basically giving individuals more freedom, right? So we would expect to see more free market like interactions, right? Less government interference. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in theory, that would lead to just more prosperity, right? More, more economic abundance through, I guess, um, freer flowing information is what we're saying here, right? This, this distributed computing system we call the free market can just operate more efficiently in a world of crypto tools than it can without them mm-hmm. um, exactly and you know imagine any business dealings a hundred years ago you know how how often did you have to talk to each other did you, you know send letters back and forth you know physical letters on a horse <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and it takes weeks before one message reaches um, and you know any business dealing any contract negotiation would, would take well months you know just for travel time alone mm-hmm. uh, and, and the fact that now standard business communication or, or conversation can be had well from any place on earth to any other place on earth mm-hmm. in high definition you know camera and audio mm-hmm. uh, that that again like that's such a such an it's it's more than just an order of magnitude you yes. know the, the the difference that that actually makes and it keeps compounding on you know there there are numerous innovations that are so substantial that you know that they are groundbreaking in and of itself but there's like 10 of them and the aggregate effect of that is is ultimately something like bitcoin you know which which is then a whole other piece that that makes everything blow up in into complexity again yeah yeah it's um it's a, it's a lot to think about i i think too i was just reflecting like on this video call how much more subtle communication there is right like just being able to see you as you're talking it's i get more of the non-verbal aspects of communication that you never got on the telephone or the telegraph or these other things so we we get not only do we get um more reach right in terms of being able to communicate with people more cheaply and more efficiently but it's also higher quality higher resolution um that we can communicate with each other in a more lifelike setting um really again really hard to just imagine what all all the the implications of that yeah so, you know, and, and to that point of the ability to keep information secret, um, you know, to go back to our previous example of having a business conversation among uh, over letters on a horse, mm. you know, the, the guy on the horse who's carrying your letter, he can read the letter, right. you know, right. so there yeah. there is no way for you to keep information secret if you send it in meat space, you know, on, on a courier, maybe there's like 10 couriers involved until it finally reaches the destination, any one of them could read it. Yeah. Um, unless you use some fancy cryptography uh, and because they don't know the private key, they literally right. cannot read it. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. So the, the common thread with Bitcoin and let's say cryptographically enabled communication is this reduction of counterparty risk, right? You just, there's less, less opportunity for the guy on the horse, the proverbial guide on the horse to read your letter. Like if you're sending the, the email, especially as you described earlier, um, by generating a private key, sending you an encrypted email that only you can decrypt. We know with a very high degree of certainty that it's that communication was for our eyes only, right? What, like the, it's like in the James Bond movie, they get the little, um, whatever, memo, fax, whatever they got, and it says for your eyes only on there. But there was a, a big degree of trust, right? That no one would open that envelope and, and all these things. And now you can get this, I mean, basically certainty, right? You can basically, for all intents of intents and purposes, you know that if you've encrypted an email properly, that no one and you've only given the key out to one recipient, there's not there's a very low likelihood that anyone else is going to see that. Um, in the same way that when you send Bitcoin to someone, right? That there's not there's a very low likelihood anyone's going to guess your private key. And when I say low likelihood, it's like you could guess i mean you probably know the numbers better than i but it's like trying to find a needle in the in a haystack the size of the universe or something like that um 
Yeah, practically impossible, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, in, in the next sentence, like this, this leads to a social and economic revolution. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, and and a monumental one, right? Uh, like it's it's social, you know, because all of a sudden the the slave master can no longer hear or understand what the slaves are talking about and and what they're trading amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. That changes everything in their relationship. Uh, and and that also makes it a economic revolution, right? Like, I mean, look at what the internet brought to commerce. It's 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 absolutely insane. Amazon is is just one of the obvious examples, but but by far not the last one. Mm -hmm. And so, in the the economic activity uh, that that has increased based on on these crypto anarchist technologies are are absolutely staggering. Um, but the great thing is that like these these technologies, even back in 1988, you know, have existed for the past decade. It's nothing new, right? These concepts have been around since a long time. Uh, just recently, we've kind of refined it uh, and, and really doubled down because we understood how, how impactful this is. Uh, but it, it's out there and, it, you know, it it can be used, it will be used. And because it's so incredibly useful, well, it will be used by almost everyone, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And the next line, he's saying... The methods are based upon public key encryption, zero knowledge, interactive proof systems, and various software protocols for interaction, authentication, and verification. So well, I think we talked already about public key encryption. Can you expand upon zero knowledge, interactive proof systems? What, what are those and what does that mean in the context of, uh, of what we're talking about here? Yeah, exactly. So zero knowledge interactive proof systems are uh, a, a subset of cryptographic uh, mathematics. Uh, and it's basically so it's an interactive proof system, meaning that two people talk to each other here. Um, uh, and it, so it's a protocol, you know, it's a multi step way of talking to each other. Uh, and while doing a little bit of math on the side to achieve a certain outcome. The, the key thing is basically that you can um, you can provide a service or you can make a statement about a piece of data without actually being able to read that piece of data or, or having it. Mm. Um, one uh, common example is, for example, a, a, a carbon paper, uh, you know, carbon copy paper uh, in an envelope. And right? mm -hmm. so um, let's say uh, I, I have a message, you know, I write that message on, on a piece of uh, paper. Uh, and let's say it says, hi, Robert, you know, what is money? Uh, and I put that piece of paper into an envelope. Uh, I, I closed it envelope. Uh, and this this envelope has this carbon copy paper, uh, you know, and let's say I give that thing to that envelope to Robert. He cannot open it or he is at least not opening it, uh, but he can sign it. You know, give me a, a fanboy autograph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, at a later point in time, you know, so he gives me back, Robert gives me back that that envelope and I can open it. And, and now I, I pull out that paper uh, where I wrote, hey, Robert, what, what is money? Um, and now because Robert wrote on the outside of the envelope, it, uh, the, the carbon seeped through. And now I have his signature on, on the internal paper. Right. Mm. So Robert just signed my message. Right. He just signed my, my autograph card. Um, but he had no idea which message he actually was signing. Mm. Right. It, it would have been uh, it could have been anything, basically, or, or just an empty paper. Um, uh, but uh, so this is a simple zero knowledge system. And wh why are these so important? This idea, because I've heard of zero knowledge proofs uh, being discussed specifically around anonymous. I think uh, I think this was Zcash, right? Wasn't Zcash trying to implement zero knowledge proofs? Mm -hmm. um, what is it? What are the big advantages of zero knowledge proofs in, in digital space? Um. Well, a lot of them, you know, and, and they're used, they're used everywhere. Like we're using them right now. Bitcoin uses them, uh, you know, ECDSA signatures, this, this private public key system that Bitcoin uses is basically a zero knowledge interactive proof system. Mm. You know, it's, it's, uh, and then there's, you know, there's a wide array of different formulas that do different interesting things. Um, uh, and yeah, that, that can be things like, um, uh, you know this this envelope carbon copy envelope that i just explained that's basically a, a chaumian blind signature you know mm. old tech from 1983 you know five years before this was published this uh, this manifesto um uh, or uh, another thing would be you know uh, something like Pedersen commitments 
mm -hmm. uh, which is something that Monero uses and uh, well, other places too, uh, that it, it basically means you can prove that uh, two values are the same, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, value A equals value B, mm -hmm. but you don't know what is value A or what, what is value B. Um, and, you know, these, these types of things are very important building blocks and we use them for everything, you know, mm -hmm. for HTTPS, uh, for, uh, you know, for, for Bitcoin signatures, uh, for, you know, Wasabi Wallet, we have a very advanced zero knowledge uh, proof system. Um, and, you know, in fact, the company CK Snacks, uh, the, the name of the company is based on zero knowledge. You know, we mm. provide zero knowledge snacks, uh, little software products mm -hmm. uh, that customers can enjoy. But while we, the service provider, have zero knowledge about our customers. Um, and it's it, so, yeah, zero knowledge systems are in, incredibly important and you use them every day. Oh, that's a huge advantage I didn't consider because if you have zero knowledge of your customers and you're no longer a honeypot for hackers, right? They could break, you know, we've heard a million of these, these hacks at this point, but if they break into a provider that has zero knowledge of the customers, there's no honey to be stolen, right? There's just, there's just nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, yet that the service provider retains some ability to provide for customers, even without their, their knowledge or without their data, I guess you might say. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. you got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> And I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy-to-use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So, go to wasabiwallet.io today to download this state-of-the-art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Element. Element is a delicious electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. Element contains the ideal electrolyte ratio. It's got 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Element has no junk. It's got no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS at all. Element is perfectly suited for people that are on a keto, low carb, or paleo diet. And as someone that eats a very heavy meat diet and does a lot of intermittent fasting, I simply love this stuff. So go to drinkelement.com slash breedlove. That's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash breedlove and make sure to get a free sample pack with your first purchase. 
Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. And so he goes on a little lower here saying the focus until now has been on academic conferences in Europe and the U.S., conferences monitored closely by the NSA, the National Security Agency, but only recently have computer networks and personal computers attained sufficient speed to make these to make the ideas practically realizable. Mm -hmm. In the next 10 years, we'll bring enough additional speed to make the ideas economically feasible and essentially unstoppable. Yeah. So is that, I mean, this is how he was able to write this document with such prescience and conviction, right? That the ideas and technologies even already existed. And it was just a matter of scaling up throughput or bandwidth to make them uh, more ubiquitous. Is that what he's saying here? Yeah, exactly. I'd like ciphers have been around for thousands of years, right. uh, especially in military context, obviously. Uh, and, and then during the, the First and Second World War, I think there was a, a big cryptography battle un, under the surface. Um, and then afterwards, it, it was still very important academic research. Again, if we're talking about math formulas, you know, this is like a, a math professor, you know, do, doing these types of stuff. So this was pure academically, uh, you know, universities talking about it, etc. Um, and of course, the, the NSA had a, a huge interest uh, to, uh, you know, to stay up to date with these. I mean, we've seen in during all the wars in, in the last century, uh, that that cybersecurity is is absolutely essential, and if if you're not playing your A game, then this is an, an incredibly huge attack vector uh, that that anyone can exploit against you. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, that's that's where the the background was done. That's that's where the the science, the cryptography was was actually developed. Um, and then so that's one thing, right? To be a theoretical a cryptographer is is really one thing. You're a math wi math wizard, you know. Um, but then implementing or, or integrating or applying these cryptographic protocols uh, in a user-facing product is an entire different set of skills. And obviously the theoretical work had to come before we could practically implement it. Uh, and this is, I think, what, what he's you know, putting on here, like the academic research is quote unquote done, plus it will continue to advance as we go forward. But now we're getting into making this into actual products, um, you know, putting this into the computer hardware and, and the computer software. Um, while simultaneously computer speed increased, uh, depending on the exact type of cryptography, but a lot of cryptography takes quite some time or computational power to do so. And if you have a really, really bad uh, computer, it might take you a day or something to, to encrypt a message, let's say, um, versus if you have much better hardware, this is done in a nanosecond, you know. Um, and, and so there were some actual technological limits in the computational hardware uh, that needed to be overcome. Uh, and, and here may definitely predicts that they are overcome. The things that are now 1988 being worked on on the production lines are already so incredibly powerful that the computational complexity of using cryptography is is negated. Um, we have way more compute power uh, compared to how tiny the computational load is uh, of these cryptographic functions. And that means we can do them all the time. You know, your computer encrypts and decrypts messages a million times a second. Um, I don't know how many packets are being encrypted during our Zoom call here. You know, that's it's it's absolutely incredible. So these these functions now run on hardware insanely fast, and that then gives a lot more space or or like room for experiments of what we can actually build on on the application layer. Um, you know, because computation power got so better and and the software got more efficient and faster to execute, that all of a sudden enables to have video calls, etc. Um, uh, and to some extent, that was clear back then, uh, but probably the the extent to which we pr uh, progressed probably was 
yeah, he, he couldn't probably imagine the amount of compute power that we have nowadays. Right. So this is someone seeing the, the existence of, as you said, the academic work is done, the, the mathematics work. It's just a matter of scaling up the technology, I guess, to, to make this mm -hmm. Obviously, you have to abstract away a lot of the complexity, make it very user friendly, commercialize it. So he, I mean, this document is really just him extrapolating from like these ideas exist. Things like Moore's law exist. So if I'm drawing mm -hmm. a line from you know now into the future, here are the implications that I foresee. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And and this the sentence also has a very similar vibe to to Bitcoin. You know, mm -hmm. all the the parts of Bitcoin have been there for for decades before Satoshi. Um, you know, did that all the theoretical part done? It was yeah. just about applying them and and putting the right pieces together, and that requires a very different mind than than the actual cryptographer or academic researcher writing the the math formulas. Um, and and Satoshi was exactly that guy. You know, I think, you know, he was he probably just grew grew up with that concept of private public keys and and other cryptographic primitives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that the people in the seventies or eighties, uh, you know, those were all rapid new ideas for them. And so they couldn't really make make all the beautiful things that could be built with that. You see some obvious things like encrypting messages or, or signing messages, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but the extent of, of, of what Bitcoin enables was only creatively possible for Satoshi because he was so, I guess, intuitive. You know, he was just the next generation. He was used to all of these principles mm -hmm. and, and you know, he could see the, the forest out of all of the trees. Mm. Yeah, well said. Um... And yeah, it reminds me of where we're at with Bitcoin today as well, right? Like the fact that obviously Bitcoin exists. Um, there are new technologies that need to be built to scale Bitcoin to add, right, to, to increase the anonymity of transactions, the throughput of transactions, things like this. But uh, it's almost obvious in a way that like given the progress of technology, given the incentives to do that, that it's just a matter of time, right? So I, I see these arguments on Twitter all the time. People say, oh, uh, Bitcoin um, naysayers will say, oh, well, it can never scale. It does 15 transactions per second. It's not private, et cetera, et cetera. But they just completely ignore all, all the other, the higher order protocol developments being done. And, um, you know, Bitcoin advocates obviously take the opposite tact and just say, well, look, if it's being done. Here's what it looks like. It evolves in layers like these sorts of things always do. We see it both in nature and the internet itself. The internet protocol stack is a, a layered, a layered technology. So, um, yeah, very very interesting stuff. I have some questions about the next line though. So he says, "Me too." <laughs> <laughs> High speed networks, ISDN, tamper proof boxes, smart cards, satellites, Ku band transmitters multi MIPS personal computers and encryption chips now under development will be some of the enabling technologies. Mm. I don't think I know what most of those are. <laughs> Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, I think that that sentence didn't age that well, um, mm. you know, because I think at the time these were all cutting edge, super fascinating things. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, okay, some of them high speed networks, I, that's the obvious one, you know, yeah. um, uh, uh, you know, or satellites, obviously, um, you know, there's even personal computers in there, which I find very interesting mm -hmm. for 1988. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what multi MIPS is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, again, right, that aspect of personal computation, like mm -hmm. this is something individual, you can control the messages and, and the cryptography, the cryptographic systems that, that you're running on your computer. Right? That, that is a big deal already. Um, uh, like smart cards and encryption chips, I'm guessing, are about uh, a, a hardware that is designed to keep a secret, uh, to, to keep your private key, um, uh, and probably to do the, uh, you know, to do the signing operations. Um, you know, so that's a hardware wallet, basically. Mm. <laughs> mm. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, tamper-proof boxes. That's a tough one. I'm not exactly sure what he means. What he might mean is that you have like a, a you put a tamper-proof box around your computer, and right? like the physical hardware of the computer. Oh, okay. And the next time you come you come there, you know that the computer wasn't tampered with. 
mm. and therefore you know that it's still running the same computation as as you instructed it with with last time um maybe it might also be a cryptographic um like uh, uh analogy you know something like a hash is tamper proof that's what, that's why we have hashes in the blockchain because well um you know you you have a like a, a precise fingerprint you know you have an input uh, a certain piece of text let's say a bitcoin block yeah. you put that into a hash function and then you have an output so, uh, yeah a certain amount of, of numbers um and the thing is if you change one bit of the input just one tiny bit of that input a completely different output comes along. Right. So you notice when the input was quote unquote tampered with, yes. uh, if it's no longer the exact same input, it will have a different hash. Uh, so that might be meant here too. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, that's a great point. So I just Googled a couple of these things real quick, but yeah, tamper evident technology. It's the same. There's the, there's tamper evident physical bags, right? You, you mm-hmm. made that banks use sometimes or, what your hardware wallet gets shipped, right? Right, yeah, your hardware wallet comes, yeah, right, with a little holographic um, sticker on it. And when that, you can tell if it's, once it's removed, it it, it changes the pattern on the seal. So it's, you, you can tell if someone's tampered with it, frankly. And that's a great connection because it's the same thing as a hash, right? You change one character in the hashed data and you get an entirely new hash. So it just makes it basically mm-hmm. impossible to tamper with. Um I looked Who at the band transmitters. What is that? Yeah, it says a <laughs> portion of the electromagnetic spectrum in the microwave range of frequencies 12 to 18 gigahertz. So, uh, some radio technology, you know, probably wireless communication, probably some yeah. long range. Um, you know, w- Wi Fi is here, you know, Bluetooth, yeah. etc. So, yeah, wireless communications is pretty cool and a, a tiny bit impactful, you know, like things like the iPhone all of a sudden become possible. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> GPS too, because it says here, Kuban's primarily yeah. used satellite communications. Interesting. Most notably the downlink used by direct broadcast satellites to broadcast satellite television and for uh-huh. special applications such as NASA's tracking data relay sat- satellite, excuse me, mm-hmm. used for the International Space Station communications and SpaceX Starlink satellites. Interesting. All the wireless stuff we're doing. Um, Kuban's metaphor, and then MIPS was microprocessor without interlocked pipeline storages stages. Sorry, obviously, <laughs> what else could it have meant? <laughs> it's a family of reduced instruction set computer RISC instruction set architectures. So it's some type of architecture yeah. processing for computers, I guess. Funny, in in hindsight, completely irrelevant. Right. Personal <laughs> computers. That's the crazy thing. But multi MIPS, yeah. by the right. way, I'm probably guilty of that, too. You know, I, I geek out about all the details of the tech and yeah. I throw in all the buzzwords <laughs> when I probably just shouldn't uh, they're just like here. <laughs> well, it's fun. I mean, the, the things change over time, too. Right. Like we what we call something in the early stages of its innovation is not typically what we call it later. Right. When the Internet was first emerging the term information superhighway was being thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Things like intranets were very popular among corporate people, right? They said, oh, we don't need the internet. We've got an intranet. And then, you know, fast forward 25 years, there's no information superhighway. It's just the internet. And there are no intranets. Mm -hmm. It's just the internet. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, this is a snippet into time, you know, it's like a snapshot. It's it's really great. Like 1988, it's so, it's so crazy to think back, you know, it was such a different world. Um, but this is all still so, so relevant, like in- incredible. Look at any other writing from 1988 and probably is, is, is not as relevant as this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the next line, he gets into um, the resistance to this, so. He writes, the state will, of course, try to slow or halt the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns, use of the technology by drug dealers and tax evaders, and fears of societal disintegration. Many of these concerns will be valid. This crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to be traded freely and will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded. So, I mean, this just immediately... 
you know, when we hear mainstream media narratives about Bitcoin, this is, this could, <laughs> this could be read as a mainstream media headline about Bitcoin today. Yeah. Right? Almost always do you hear the Jamie Diamonds of the world or any, uh, any in, anyone with an entrenched interest against the success of Bitcoin, mm-hmm. typically legacy financial incumbents or politicians, um, what, what do they do, right? They say, oh, it's a national security concern. It's only used by drug dealers and, and tax cheats. And if uh, Bitcoin succeeds, it'll boil the oceans and you know all of these things. So yeah. um, I don't think that first line there could have been any more on point. I mean, the actual headlines in 2023 read almost verbatim what he was yeah. saying the state would say about these technologies. Exactly. And also so great is, is that part with, of course, they will try to slow or halt the spread. Uh, but kind of Im- implied here is that they, they can succeed. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, they, they will try. Uh, and, and we've seen that throughout the history after this piece was written. Um, they tried, even though it is nonsensical. And because it was nonsensical and they still tried, uh, it it failed. It didn't succeed. The technology continued uh, to be used and to get better and to be much more impactful than than they just could have dreamed of at, at the mm. beginning. Yeah, great point. Um, that second line, crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to be traded freely and will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded. I mean, this is WikiLeaks mm-hmm. and Silk Road, right? Just yeah, damn. Obviously, WikiLeaks. All of this information that governments have been accustomed to being able to keep siloed and secret mm-hmm. was all of a sudden just just burst into public consciousness via the internet mm-hmm. um, and, and distributed right that's that's the other big thing uh, that right. that the internet helped with you know qu- quite funnily you're like you can use cryptographic tools to keep secrets and you can be quite good at it. So if the government were a bit competent and, and knew what they were doing, they you know could encrypt messages, et cetera, uh, and, and make such leaks of, of sensitive information way less occurrent. Of course, mm-hmm. though not perfect. Um, but the, well, the, the thing is um, that once such an information is uh, or has been found out, then it can be published anonymously without mm-hmm. attributing the name to the publisher and, and, and uh, published to 8 billion people who are online. Um, uh, and instantly, uh, uh, with without you know taking the information back and and hiding it, uh, so that definitely uh, you know puts puts a lot of pressure on on you know what governments do as as investigative journalists have have a substantial amount of power now. You know, WikiLeaks is is the is the perfect example. Again, predicted 1988, absolutely yes. incredible. Yeah, yeah, the asymmetry of one guy being able to get a hold of that that mm-hmm. data and distribute it worldwide, right? You, s- prior to the internet, that was basically an impossibility, right? It was really hard for one guy to do something like that. Yeah. Post internet, it's almost a triviality, right? It's like, once mm-hmm. you get it, you just publish it to the internet and it's there forever. Yeah. And, um, and the response yeah. from the state against people like Julian Assange is also very telling, right? There's still... Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as I know, there's still what well, he's in. Where is he now? Is he in Russia? Uh, no, I believe he is back in the UK. Um, and I'm I'm not sure about the very latest, but I thought there was some uh, uh, plans to ship him to America. Yeah. Uh, and then Edward Snowden, details. I think he's still taking refuge. He's the one that's in Russia, I think. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Ross Ulbricht that set up the Silk Road, still in prison for just... yeah launching an internet marketplace. Well, the next sentence in the manifesto, an anonymous computerized market. Yeah. That's all that Ross did. And right? uh, to to allow people to to speak freely among each other, to communicate and, and negotiate trade. Yeah. Um, yet that was very much tried to slow or halt the spread of that technology. And of course, it miserably failed. It's yeah. not like, you know, markets disappeared after Silk Road was shut down. Quite on the contrary, like 10 alternatives popped up right after uh, and, and are up and running ever since. Um, by the way, by anonymous organizers or, or operators right, that, that can provide such a service uh, without attributing it to their names, um, mm-hmm. all outlined in this document. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, 
yeah, the drug trade, it's so very interesting place to keep up with technological developments, you know, because now I've read these headlines of, you know, drones, both airborne drones, uh, aquatic drones, like submarine drones, boat drones Mm -hmm. being used to distribute drugs. Uh, Obviously, people just doing it through the mail under these uh, anonymous or pseudonymous identities. Um, Makes it very difficult for a central power to try to keep up with all of these disparate means of, of distributing goods and information just as mr may predicted um, yeah yeah exactly and and like it includes inherent uh, or like abhorrent things like assassination and extortion right. um like this this technology cannot exclusively used quote unquote by the good guys that's right. an impossibility right. because even the bad guys are humans and even right. the bad guys have property in their body and even these bad guys can speak and compute as they see fit including those protocols of cryptography uh, that that hide the information or or that enables them to get a reputation uh, to you know hey i've done all of these you know assassinations in the past successfully and that is you know verified and attestated etc right. and that that is available to them and they will use it and there is literally nothing that can be done about that yes no absolutely and this is why the whole Bitcoin is used by drug dealers thing is so absurd. Yeah. I, I always like to describe it as a tool is inherently amoral, right? A, t- a tool is not a conscious actor. It's something we're using, right? A, a, a user is appropriating or perhaps expropriating the tool for their own aims. So you can use a hammer, you know, to do something productive, like build a house or you can use it to do something destructive, like bash someone's skull in. And so to try and assign the, the hammer, the responsibility, or the, or the moral um, agency is just, is just nonsense, right? So um, the tools are always subject to the intentionality and thus the morality of their users. So it doesn't make any sense to say Bitcoin's used by drug dealers. And it also fails to mention the U.S. dollar, right? The U.S. dollar is used for more drug trafficking and uh, all types of criminal transactions in the world use like many orders of magnitude more than any other form of money. Yet you don't see any headlines saying, oh, the U.S. dollar is bad because drug dealers use it, right? It it just doesn't register by any sense of rationality whatsoever. Yet you see these headlines almost weekly. Um, Yeah, yeah. And here, like perfect sentence, right? Various criminals and foreign elements will be active users of CryptoNet. By the way, CryptoNet is really cool. You don't you don't hear that any often anymore. Yeah, what did he mean by that? Is that just the guess the encrypted internet? But the internet wasn't even was the internet even used as a term in 1988? I probably not, to be honest. Um, So yeah. Huh. Uh, I guess the on the marketing battle between CryptoNet and Internet, uh, the Internet won. <laughs> it's just a shame. Um, just one other point on the the you know central powers trying to stop these tools. You know, you mentioned PGP earlier, but the the U.S. Circuit Court case on PGP I think is always really useful, where mm-hmm. um, they were attempting to classify pretty good privacy software as munitions to prevent it from being exported to foreign nations. And it was legit. I mean, the case, I think it went to us circuit court. So it was a a very contentious case, but once someone printed out PGP software, printed all the source code on paper and presented it as evidence, they said, how can you classify this as munitions? Clearly it's text on paper. It's all it is. It's protected under freedom of speech, the first amendment. Mm -hmm. And that was it, right? That, that blew the whole case apart. And, PGP was not classified as munitions because you can't, to illegalize information, you create all these nonsensical things, right? Like you can have illegal names, illegal words on t-shirts, illegal numbers. Like it, it, you get into really weird territory. Yeah. Uh, I think BitTorrent was another, right? Where mm-hmm. was it, was it, um, I had friends in college, they were being sued for using lime wire and things like this so they would get this notice from the recording artists of america some some affiliation and they would say you know you 
we caught you downloading these songs or movies, whatever it may be, you need to pay us $10,000 or we'll, we'll sue you. And, um, the market basically adapted, right. And started using this BitTorrent service that chopped the files into a lot of pieces so that no individual ever had the whole thing. You could just go out to the internet and like reassemble it into one, mm -hmm. one usage. So it was just this great, that, that whack-a-mole dynamic, right? Like you described with Silk Road, when a central authority, central authorities are really good at dealing with centralized targets, but when they try to attack a decentralized target, it's that whack-a-mole or hydra thing, right? You cut off the head of one hydra and seven more sprout up in its place. And um, I think that just speaks to the structural dynamic of centralized versus decentralized powers. And, you know, centralized powers are basically just impotent to deal with decentralized networks yeah. and architectures. Yeah, exactly. It's That's just how reality is. You know, the, yeah. the king cannot uh, make you change your body. You know, like, uh, or, you know, say certain words, or he cannot prevent you from thinking certain thoughts. It's, that's just not how our reality is, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, crypto anarchy is, is very much in line with that. It's, it's not trying to do that, you know, it's not compelling people to, to do certain actions or to speak in certain ways. You know, no crypto anarchist would, would uh, force you to use encryption, for example, mm -hmm. we're just stating that you can use encryption. You're you're capable. You're you're powerful enough uh, to do this, um, and, and it is your right to do. Uh, and you are not harming anyone uh, by, for example, using encryption. Mm. Yes, yeah, great point. Um, and yeah, I'm just reminded of that quote. I don't know if it if it lands perfectly or not, but they say it's not the power of the river that cuts the stone, but it is its persistence. So it's, mm -hmm. you, it's really hard to stop the flow of these things, right? There's, you can't dam it up. You try to stop it here and it flows around whatever obstruction or artifice you put in place regulation to try and stop it. And ultimately, because it's just has this informational nature, right? And so it's like, how do you stop ideas from flowing? It's very difficult. Yeah. It's like trying to you know, if you tried to ban English or something, right, it just doesn't work. How it's not mm. enforceable. And so the fact that we've made so many of these tools just, you know, they're just digitized or informationalized, it makes them very difficult for, for any authority to try and stop. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, again, as, as the next sentence goes, this, this fundamentally alters uh, everything. Um, you know, the... Uh, like just in the past, the, the printing technology, mm -hmm. uh, it, it completely disseminated and, and fundamentally changed the, the construct of, of, you know, medieval guilds or, or social power structures back then. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, printing press, obviously, it was huge, you know, and it, you know, enabled the much more um, widespread publication uh, of, of uh, text and the cheap reproduction of it, the cheap copying of it, um, which, which was you know, incredible. Um, and it was a huge step from, you know, a clergyman writing or hand copying a, a book yes. takes years to do. Um, yes. You know, uh, that that step to having a printing press was already huge, you know. But now compare a, a high quality printing press compared to the internet and digital communications technology and wireless communication technologies. I mean, it's it, it's as as much of an yeah, of an incredible increase each each time. Yes. No, I love this example. I've I've talked about this, um, written about this actually in the, in the sovereignism series because this is mm -hmm. also something mentioned in the sovereign individual book. But yeah, pre printing press books were these luxury items, right? They were hand, really, literally hand copied in the scriptorium, right? Monks would copy one book into another book. These are big leather bound luxury items. People, most people couldn't afford them basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get this technological change that makes the copying of books much cheaper. So now you, you basically, you cause the cost of book production to plummet. So now it's gone from a luxury item to a, a very obtainable item for a lot of people. And it seems like kind of a simple thing, but what you've done with that, that simple technological change, um, 
and improving the cost effectiveness of copying information is it ultimately broke the the medieval church's monopoly on book production because they kind of they owned that whole thing um lowered the cost of books made them more widely available but the second order effect was even more pronounced was that it led to a boom in literacy like just the rates of literacy more people learned to read more people became uh developed numeracy right so they became familiar with literacy and numeracy uh led to more critical thinking more critical thinkers um and so this like the way i like to think about that is you had this hardware update right we switched from handwriting books to copying them via via printing press the printing press too was interesting that it was just a composite of a few available technologies kind of like bitcoin like it it was an innovation but it wasn't there wasn't a lot of novelty in it other than the combination of some existing technologies and then so you had this hardware update in the printing press that led to this cognitive software update across the world for many hundreds of years later like that we're still benefiting from right we we yeah. take you know in the west especially we take literacy almost for granted at this point but for a long time you know in ancient egypt to be a scribe that was like a very that was a job right just to know how to read and write yeah and now it's um clearly changed the world um i would i would argue for the better yeah yeah it, it changed the world and it it you know changed us as as humans this yeah. is a psychotechnology you know as you say literacy like it literally changes the way that you think right. um and the, you know the this is the same or this has been the same with with all the technological changes uh, or or technological improvements they they actually change you and i think we see this nowadays again with, with bitcoin i mean talk to bitcoiners they had, most bitcoiners had the the most incredible profound change uh, to their character uh, to their life to their principles after discovering and inter or engaging with this technology it, it literally made them different beings um, and, and that is that is absolutely mind-boggling, especially if we try to extrapolate, you know, what, what are the long-term consequences of this? Not, and, and, you know, with our minds being changed by Bitcoin and other technologies, we will all of a sudden have the creativity to come up with new technologies that are as mind-bogglingly uh, more crazy than what we have now. And yeah. so the, the long consequences are, yeah, in, in, ineffable. Yeah, it's super fascinating. I feel like you it happens faster than we might realize because I even, I mean, I'm in my late thirties, but I have a friend, he has a son, probably 16, uh, you know, grew up on the internet, grew up on YouTube, grew up on all oh. social media. He, the guy, the kid's brain is structured differently, right? He's like, mm -hmm. his, he's so tapped into the internet. Like the internet's an extension of his brain in a way that it's not for me. Like I, I use the internet a lot. I work in a digital business, but just, that 20 year gap or whatever in our ages, he, he is adapted to this new technological paradigm in a way that I never will. Right. And so now I have, yeah. you can now look at people a couple of decades older than us and appreciate why they aren't so maybe bullish on Bitcoin or bullish on digital technologies. Like they just, they didn't grow up with it in the way we did. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes you wonder, you know, how, how much human beings can change in just the span of a few decades. It's really, yeah. it's really incredible. Yeah, exactly. You know how much one person can change mm -hmm. just within a couple of years, and then what what happens if if you know everyone around you has changed, and you have multiple generations that 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 have just different psychotechnologies? Yes. The, the consequences are are incredibly profound. Yeah, human beings running new software, and it yeah. really does change you from the inside out, literally. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and by extent, not just does it literally change individuals, but it also changes corporations, you know, mm -hmm. and, and companies and, and ventures. Right. You can achieve an incredible amount of, of benefit and, and user benefit in this world by, by you know, a couple people, uh, you know, communicating online and coordinating whatever they, they, the product they, they want to offer. Um, the, the, the nature of, of which problems people have uh, and how they collaborate in order to to alleviate these problems uh, has has changed. Well, you know, insanely. I mean, your job hasn't existed. <laughs> you know, it, it's just a, a while ago. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. In fact, <laughs> you know, if you, if you think about it, um, uh, and you know, but by now, imagine you know, you're you're hiring people. Like this is this is a big you know corporation, and 
well, it it's of course fundamentally different be, because we have things like encryption and, and the internet and obviously video calls and obviously Bitcoin to talk about. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's very hard to get your head around all of it. Um, and again, so last paragraph here, first sentence of the last paragraph, he writes, just as the technology of the printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds and the social power structures, so too will cryptologic methods fundamentally alter the nature of corporations and of government interference in economic transactions. Yeah. So we talked about earlier. And it's a big on, one, right? No, yeah. Not just does it help you to build better corporations, or okay, first, not just does it improve your own way of thinking and acting, it helps how you and others collaborate in form of corporations, and it removes the ability for other people to interfere with your corporation, right? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is insane. Like this is a, a, a threefold great improvement over the status quo. Right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and May goes on to write that combined with emerging information markets, crypto anarchy will create a liquid market for any and all material which can be put into words and pictures. And now this one, I mean, I don't think they had any inkling about 3D printing at this time. I could be wrong. Mm. But when you combine that notion that you're going to have this liquid, global liquid, uh, un- interferable, if that's even a word, market, a market that's resistant to interference for all material, which can be put into words and pictures. And then you combine that with the concept of something like 3D printing, right? Where guns are now just digital information in a way, right? They're anything really. I think the long run implications of 3D printing is that we can produce basically anything from, from software and, and materials. So, um, just truly mind bending implications, right? When almost like physical reality itself um, becomes this idea that we can manipulate through technology. Um, yeah. And on, it is, staggering. yeah. And it, it says it's a liquid market, mm -hmm. right? Which, which I think has, has in part multiple meanings. For one, it means that it's very wide in the sense of regardless of how niche your problem is or, or the product that you're inquiring you will find someone on the internet who is as weird as you and who has thought about it and who has figured it out and made a product out of it. Um, you know, so that discovery of, of availability is great. Um, but then also in terms of liquidity, you know, the like liquidity is just an order book. It's just people, you know, saying that, hey, I'm, I have intent to buy or sell. And the more people do that, the better. Well, obviously, we can talk to more people with the internet. So just inherently, that gives us a much more liquid market. But not just that, we can communicate with people multiple times a second, or at least our computers can, you know, which means that we can do trades at an incredible fast rate uh, with an incredible wide uh, array of products and with a huge amount of people, basically internationally. And so that is, is already crazy. Yeah, so the scope and frequency of free exchange is just like we're, we're throwing gas on that fire, right? And it... Mm -hmm. And that is, that's the purpose of markets, right? Is you want to increase the scope and frequency of exchange so that you can, we can spur more innovation, create more wealth, increase the division of labor, all these things. So just by like porting our, I guess, the communication paradigm, the transformation in the communication paradigm, almost like what we said earlier about the printing press leading to more literacy, more numeracy, right? That's a change in communication paradigm. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, people start to read and write to one another a lot more than just maybe telling stories around the campfire. Well, all of a sudden, you get a, a lot more books being published, right? And books um, have a lot more durability than a story told next to the campfire. So you get this, this boom, right? It's an, there's an economic boom that follows mm -hmm. these, these changes in communication paradigms. It's um, really fascinating here. Yeah, and, and I, I love how he finishes this too, because this this idea of barbed wire um, changing the concept of property, and now we have what what like digital barbed wire with with crypto cryptography. Mm. Yeah, that statement is also super deep, and also so barbed wire is is basically a a, a, way, a cheap way to make a fence, mm -hmm. uh, you know that also keeps predators or, or prey away because it's well pointy or um and 
it uh, it, it established a lot of things, you know, especially he mentions the the frontier West in America, which of course was like this explorer mindset, you know, let's, let's conquer or let's discover new lands uh, and, and put them to good use, uh, which, which basically out of this came, came the homesteading tradition, mm -hmm. you know, like if, if some, if nobody is using something like a natural state of, of resources and, and you're the first one to, to use it and to use those resources to satisfy your, your ends and to solve your problems, that then it becomes your property and it is your right to to use these resources as you see fit um and then barbed wire fences kind of you know almost took that to some extent to to a negative uh, mm. because all of a sudden you could just fence off a huge area you know and say hey this huge square i just put a fence around it that's mine now i put it into productive use mm. um and you know actually like uh austrian economists kind of argue with with this line of thinking um that this is not the proper way of of defining the property or, or establishing the first use uh, because otherwise you know you could just walk around the entire island uh on the beach and all of a sudden you know the entire island is yours everything in, at the heart of it that that doesn't seem to make so much sense right but but barbed wire fences made it possible to claim first use on a huge area of land uh which then you know had later consequences obviously um uh, that, that that shaped it right again uh, may is not uh, value judging here he's just saying there was a fundamental change when we had barbed wire fences because establishing first use was way cheaper for a larger amount of land and that is to a large extent how how the the modern definition of property rights was was shaped the the way that it was hmm. yeah yeah i think uh, i may have Twisted the analogy there a little bit because he's saying here that this arcane branch of mathematics, where we get cryptography, can come to be the wire clippers that dismantle a lot of the barbed wire around intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, and intellectual property, I think we talked about this. I think with with ethics of money production, that that's just yeah. it's a contradiction in terms in a way, right? That mm -hmm. you know, property it, it, it it's a relationship between an owner and a scarce asset and something that's intellectual is informational. It's non-scarce, right? To, to give you the message does not exclude me from using the message kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, again, back to this technology being an accelerant or amplifier to the free market process, it seems like it could be used to do away with or cut through a lot of the the artifice we have surrounding intellectual property today yeah exactly right that they um they they literally clip the artificially big boundaries around the information um mm -hmm. that that, uh, that would that was established and yes yeah, as, as you said and you also had the the great series with stefan kinsella um mm -hmm. who has the phenomenal book against intellectual property where he really Lays, lays this out and of course he heavily draws from from this crypto anarchist manifesto as well um and yeah this you know like it, a, a world is different when you have barbed wire fences compared to when you when you don't have them and the world is very different when people have clippers that can you know destroy your barbed wire fences and all of a sudden you know a random herd of cows is is on your uh, on your fields um th that that again changes fundamentally how things are uh, and what he points around to that, that what cryptography does is, is you know, to clip the, the the fences of intellectual property, uh, meaning that you 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 can no longer hold on to the information. Um, yeah. It 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 will be published, and you can no longer hold on to uh, uh, to like the cryptographic formulas. You know, if something once uh, like is, is going to be encrypted. Well, there's nothing you can do about it, even if you have, let's say, intellectual property of the cryptographic formula. For example, Schnorr signatures was under a patent. A mm -hmm. Professor Schnorr, a German cryptographer, he discovered this math formula, put a patent on it. That doesn't stop anyone from using that math formula to encrypt messages or to sign them. Right? And uh, that that's, is, is what he is basically alluring here to. And of course, wrapping it up beautifully with the final sentence of arise, you have nothing to lose but your barbed wire fences, um, which is, of course, iconic. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, really, uh, it's it's to the core. Yeah, iconic indeed. And I, I guess that would be a good way to sum it up, perhaps, that we have cryptography bursting the 
proverbial dams holding back the free flow of information, right? And then mm. the legacy institutions we've used to deal with the flows of information or to try and control them or whatever, they're all in jeopardy, right? <laughs> um, so obviously, you know, governments and other legacy institutions are not going to be particularly embracing of this this shift in paradigm. But um, what what is the old Victor Hugo quote? There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. It's like once mm. people are ready for it, they want it, and there's a technological vehicle, right, that's that's capable of delivering it to them. Just like with the printing press we described earlier, the the flow of information is seemingly unstoppable. And so, um, I think he's done a great job of just giving us this directional analysis of where the world is heading. And I mean, I would say pretty spot on given it was written, what, 30, some 35 years ago now. Yeah. 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 Really it's, uh, you know, in hindsight, a lot of these things seem, seem obvious, mm -hmm. but same as with the sovereign individual, you know, you read it and you're like, yeah, it's kind of common sense, <laughs> mm -hmm. but from, you know, if you put yourself back 35 years, it's anything but common sense. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, but there, there were certain principles enshrined in math formulas and technologies uh, and, and he understood those technologies and um, he could see what they enabled um, uh, and he could see what, what principles they're standing upon, you know, that this is just information and uh, that, well, there's no way to stop it, etc. Uh, and then just extrapolated of, of where does this go? I, I think he does a really great job of keeping this value free. <laughs> He's almost like a praxeologist here. <laughs> yeah. um, and it, it it's a very neutral and and correct, you know, statement. Um, uh, and yeah, there, it, it, this is, I think in part why, why it is so foundational uh, for later writings that are, that are going to come. And, and in the series, uh, we're going to next read the, the cypherpunk manifesto by, by Eric Hughes, um, I think five years later, and it definitely very much draws on, on, on these ideas of the crypto anarchist manifesto and um, puts a, another great spin on it. I think these two pieces together, just go so well, and they're both in, in tandem so so prescient of of how Bitcoin is gonna, uh, or first of all that something like Bitcoin was inevitable, mm -hmm. um, and that now now that we have it, that it is absolutely unstoppable, um, and I yeah and this uh, this is then also you know it it established it it did not just inspire uh, Satoshi to to build Bitcoin. Uh, or, well, I mean, this this piece inspired so many people. Uh, you know, BitTorrent certainly got inspired from it. Ha a proof of work, um, like Adam Back, was certainly inspired by 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 this and, and following writings. Um, and of course, the things that we're doing now, uh, you know, in the cutting edge with, with Bitcoin um, nowadays and the Bitcoin privacy that is going on, this is all really going back to to this piece as, as a root or, or a very deep dependency uh, in in this network of knowledge that we've built up around well individual freedom and and anarchist thought and cryptography uh, as as a principle, yeah, beautifully said. Um, and I think just to conclude, and I hope this is fitting, uh, the author of this piece, Timothy May, has one of the best email signatures I've ever seen. And so uh, to sign off this episode, I would just like to read what was contained in his email signature and he wrote uh crypto anarchy colon and then he wrote uh the following terms separated by commas encryption digital money anonymous networks digital pseudonyms zero knowledge reputations information markets black markets collapse of governments beautiful <laughs> Beautiful indeed. All right, Max, this is awesome. I look forward to our next one together. Yeah, I really enjoyed this uh, and hopefully a bunch more to come. <laughs>